CEO of Crisil. My colleagues and I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone here to our seminar on investment banking, The Road Ahead. Today's event has been put together by Crisil Global Research and Analytics and Coalition, both of which are divisions of Crisil. A brief introduction to the company. Crisil, whose majority shareholder is Standard & Poor's, is a global analytical company that began life 25 years ago as India's first credit rating agency. Today, we continue to be India's biggest and most credible rating agency, but our largest business today is represented by Crisil Global Research and Analytics, or GR&A, and Coalition, which work with global investment banks to provide a rich and unique range of offerings. While Coalition works with the strategy teams and the CFOs of investment banks, Crisil GR&A works with the business and operating teams in research, investment banking, front office, mid office, and the risk areas. Coalition provides key decision makers in banks with unique and in-depth insights on their competitors, covering revenues, headcount, costs, risk-weighted assets, and return on equity, and also on their client wallets. Crystal gr and supports the execution agenda of the banks in research and analytics, as well as in risk management. Uh, we support equity, fixed income, and credit research on the one hand, to derivatives, CCAR, and PRA-related work relating to model building and model validation on the other. So, as you can see, Coalition's analytics helps bank work on the business, while Crystal gr and help them work in the business. Together, gr and and Coalition provide what is an exceptional combination of analytics, insights, and services to global investment banks. We together work with over 20 investment banks, and that includes all the top 14 in the world. We also work with 23 firms on the buy side, including investment management, hedge funds, and private equity firms. If you were to ask me what really defines us, I would say it's a steadfast allegiance to analytical rigor and the credibility of our work. Our in-depth work with investment banks enables us to provide deep institutional insights and perspectives. Today's event will demonstrate how we bring the best of coalition and Crystal GRNA together to clients with analyses and perspectives that complement each other. Over the next 90 minutes, we will have four short presentations and a panel discussion. Let me set a brief context. After the financial crisis of 2008, the global investment banking industry has been trying to reinvent itself in the face of declining revenues and profitability, and at the same time, the imperatives of efficient capital management. Therefore, banks today are taking decisions on which product lines to build upon and which product lines to jettison based on risk-weighted assets or capital requirements. They are also making choices on cost structures by increasingly rejigging their operating models. In doing so, they are asking the hard questions on where to locate their resources, onshore, nearshore, or offshore, and also how to use technology and automation effectively to combine these. In addition, banks are also finding cost-effective ways to deal with regulatory requirements and regulatory compliance issues, such as by accessing global talent pools. In today's seminar, we will discuss all these aspects and also the choices that investment banks have. We will begin today's proceedings with Stéphane Besson providing an overview of the state of investment banking, such as trends in revenue, profitability, and balance sheet, and he will also talk about how banks are looking at their business models. Next. Suprabha will talk about how banks are looking at strategically transforming their operating models, that is people, processes, and technology, to achieve sustainable cost structures. Suprabha will be followed by Serge DeCoster, 
who will speak on how regulatory changes are increasing pressures on bank ROEs and how banks are reacting and preparing themselves to improve their risk-weighted assets and their leverage ratios. And finally, Stamatula Matsukis will cover the role of models in efficient capital management. We will end our seminar with a panel discussion on the themes that we are presenting today. I'm very thankful to our distinguished panelists, Ali Al-Maki, Global COO, Fixed Income Sales at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, David Hudson, CFO Global Markets, JP Morgan, David Phillips, Group Head of Risk Analytics, RBS Risk Management, and Keith Carbett, MD and Head of Model Risk Management, Credit Suisse, who have agreed to be a part of today's panel discussions. We look forward to benefiting from all your tremendous experience and insights. Overall, I believe that today's discussions will provide food for thought, validate some beliefs and ideas, and also challenge others. I do hope you will find the discussions insightful and interesting. Once again, I thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I look forward to interacting with you with cocktails in the evening after the seminar. And I would now like to invite Stefan Besson, CEO of Coalition, to come on stage and make his presentation. Over to you, Stefan. that is leading to very different strategies across banks. More specifically, we're gonna look at uh, first the overall market environment. We will then uh, look at the performance of what we call the coalition index, the top 10 global investment banks. And we'll finish by some of the key questions that the banks have to ask themselves and how that could lead to some very different strategies. So let's start here with the big picture. Uh, what you have in front of you are the total revenues for the the industry across IBD equities and FICC. No surprise to any of you, the trend has been negative for the past five years. Uh, and we are in uh, around $267 billion as of today. That has been driven by the poor performance of the FICC business. So now clearly the key question is, are we in the middle of a cycle or is that a structural change? And at Coalition, we think that we are actually, things are here to stay. Uh, this is a structural change. Now the next question is what is gonna be the new norm? So in order to answer this question, let's look at each of the asset class. Let's start with IBD. At 76 billion last year, it's close to the record high of 2007 at 79 billion. So we think that you know, it's clearly possibly a stable state of the industry. Equity, 64 billion has had a lot of growth versus last year. There could be a bit more room for improvement uh, a, a few other billions, but we are very close to also a, a plateau. So the key question is what's gonna happen to FICC given it's the largest component? To answer this question, we need to look at the main subproduct of that category, which is rates. And you can see here that in 09 rates was around 40% of the total FICC, only 25% last year. So the key question is what's gonna happen to that market? Clearly we think that if when volatility comes back, interest rate starts rising a little bit. This 34 billion might increase. But all in, we think FICC might stabilize around $130 billion. So if you add all of that, you get to a new norm, what we think is around $270 billion for the industry. Which means that, unfortunately, there's limited growth in the near term. So now let's look at what's gonna happen between now and that new norm. So what you have here on this page is a client activity. So here we are looking at just the revenues generated by all the clients of the investment bank. We look at more than 20,000 clients at Collision and look in excruciating detail at the top 2,000. And basically the trend has been again negative for the past four years with a slight uptick last year. Now if you look in more detail, you see that uptick is coming from the corporate segment, which as we know is very bumpy, lumpy. It's not an ongoing activity, it may not repeat this year or in the next two years. But more importantly, if you look at the institutional client activity, which is the largest, 
this 160 billion is hiding a very strong performance of the hedge fund. And as most of you know, hedge funds provide a lot of volume to the industry, but very little money. And banks and hedge funds are you know, starting to look more alike. So when you exclude that extra performance, you actually realize that there's a drop of 1% uh, and 2% drop in the institutional client base. So what looks like a slight increase is actually a drop. Now, if you look by region, it's even more interesting. EMEA and Americas are declining after uh, taking into account this hedge fund extra performance. Asia Pacific is increasing, but that's a lot have to do with the Japanese one time, a lot of very strong performance in East Japan, which we think will not happen again. So I think the message on that chart is the client activity has been weak. We think it will re remain weak you know, for the next one or two years. Now let's look at how the investment banks are reacting to that. So what you have here is the total front office revenue producer for the top 10 investment banks. So it's sales, trading, and research all together. You can see that since the peak of 2010, banks have cutting significantly, especially in 2012 with an 18% drop of headcount. Now last year, the reduction has slowed down slightly with some areas like equities actually increasing headcount by 2%. So that analysis shows us, or makes us believe, that I think banks have right-sized the front office headcount. Um, they're really cutting as much as they could. So the next question is, how does that translate to the bottom line in terms of operating margin? So what we're going to analyze now is a new analysis by Coalition looking at the fully loaded costs um, across the front office compensation, front office direct expenses, as well as all allocated expenses for group or IB. What is excluded is tax, it's pre-tax analysis, and all one-time litigation expenses. What you see immediately on the IB is for the past four years, the operating margin has increased to a 32%. That is driven by increase of revenue and cost reduction. While equity has been hovering around 25%, there was a decrease of revenues and a decrease of cost, slight uptick last year, but it's around 25-26%. And then FICC. FICC, and that's what the problem is, used to have 50% operating margin, dropped to 34% last year, with a very high volatility, as you can see. And that doesn't include one-time litigation cost. As a result, if you look at the overall IB, the profit margin has been volatile, but it's clearly on the downward trend. So yes, the front office revenue producers have been right-sized, but there are clearly a lot of cost pressure, maybe on the comp with front office, on the middle office, on the back office. Um, and that's one of the challenges that actually my colleague Supraba will address in the next section. So as a result, very fragile state uh, of the industry, weak client activity, cost pressure. So as soon as there's a little spark, that could go into a downward spiral. And that's exactly what happened, unfortunately, in the first quarter of this year, where for the top 10 investment banks, revenue dropped by 9% overall. And as you can see, driven a lot by the FICC, very poor performance of 16% quarter on quarter, sorry, year on year for the first quarter. The feedback of what we are hearing for the second quarter is not very good news. We think that 16% might actually continue for the second quarter. So when you translate that into productivity, revenue per headcount, front office headcount, you see that IBD equities are stable around 2.3, 2.6 million per head, but FICC is continuing to drop at 4.7 million per head. And that tells us that unfortunately for the year, and possibly next year, we're gonna see a bit more front office headcount reduction, especially in FICC, um, which will have a, a, a negative spiral. So as a summary, before we look at how banks can react, the long-term prospect of the industry, the new norm, is around 270 billion, limited growth, and possibly a couple of years of very difficult or challenging time ahead of us. So with that in mind, let's look at how banks can react. So what we've analyzed here is we are, we're gonna plot the top 10 investment banks along two dimensions. If you look first at the x-axis, it's what we call the level of completeness or how complete a bank is along three dimensions, the product mix, the regional footprint, and the client franchise. And on the next slide, we're gonna compare each bank mix along these three dimensions against the market average. The second dimension, the efficiency dimension, is looking at three sub-criteria, how 
uh, headcount productivity, how many million of revenues per front office headcount, RWA productivity, how many re dollar revenue per R uh, RWA, dollar of RWA, and finally, operating margin. So when we plot uh, the top 10 banks, um, you get that picture. So clearly here we are seeing a couple of interesting trends. The first one is what we would call this group of, uh, of banks that are going maybe after the world domination, trying to be complete across product, region, and cloud type. Right now you have five banks. You know, we think going forward they could be you know, three, four. Uh, clearly, according to us, the American Universal are quite well positioned to be there. Then you have a second group of banks, uh, which are, at, as of now, the two Swiss banks, but you know, more banks will join that group, which are banks that really decided to go after maybe a multi-specialist approach, very uh, selective on which product they go after, but looking for high return or high efficiency. So we think that these 10 banks and, and the other five or, or so, uh, which would be the top 15 investment banks, will migrate over time in one of these two groups. So in order to do that, they're going to have to ask themselves three questions. The first one is which product, sorry, which region to compete in. So let me describe this graph before I, I go into the detail. So what you have here is the revenue, the headcount productivity. So FIC at the global level is four million per head. Each of these stars is a different bank among the top ten banks. And we've done the analysis for FICC, equities, IBD, and for each of the region. So what does it tell us? Starting by the bottom, looking at Asia Pacific. Major insight, Asia Pacific productivity is the lowest, it's quite low. And very likely most of the banks are actually losing money uh, across most of their product in Asia, at least these top 10 banks. So that leads to a lot of question about you know, what to do in that region. Do you want to stay, do you want to exit? Some banks have already decided to exit. Do you want to focus on offshore, onshore cloud, offshore cloud? Do you want to have a flying model? Do you want to get local licenses? A lot of questions around Asia Pacific. A very difficult um, region for investment banks. Looking at Europe, very good, quite good productivity and very compact. The, the banks are all very close to each other, um, which for us is a sign of intense complexity intense competitivity, sorry, in Asia, in, um, in Europe. And as we know, the universal banks, the American banks, are really pushing hard in Europe as we speak. Finally, Americas. I will just highlight the fact that if you want to be an IBD player, you need to be in Americas. The productivity is massively higher, and it's very difficult to make money if you're not a strong home market. Let's look at the second question, which is which asset class to compete in. So what you have here in front of you are the revenue of these top 10 investment banks which have been normalized, starting with publicly reported numbers. And these numbers you have in front of you are very different from what is publicly reported. We normalize for accounting differences and organizational differences. At the end of the day, the FICC picture is very clear. Banks have decided to compete in certain products, but not all products. As a result, the, steep, the curve is very steep. Now, if you look at equities, a very different story. The curve is very flat. The top seven banks are really within, uh, very close to each other, and they all want to be everything to everybody, all region, all product, all cloud types. A lot of cross-selling opportunities in the equities product, but unfortunately, as we, uh, we will see on the next slide, not too many banks are actually making money uh, in some of these sub-products. IBD, a little bit in between FICC and equity, with the three major European ahead and, and, and the others behind. So once banks have decided where they really want to focus their resources in terms of capital uh, and people, then they'll have to ask which sub-product do I want to focus on. So what you have here is an analysis of operating margin, again at the bank-by-bank -bank level by sub-product. So each of these stars represents one of these top 10 banks. So as we've seen before, FICC pro uh, profitability quite high, 43%. Surge. Uh, in a second, we'll speak about the high capital requirement, which are driving the ROE down, but very good profitability at 43%, and across most of these products, with the exception of commodities and JIT and FX. Commodities banks are exiting some of these businesses, uh, and JIT and FX, very tough competition, really, it's a, it's a volume with electronic trading, a game. 
So banks will have to decide, depending which star they are on that, uh, on that graph, whether they want to compete in that product. Equities, I will just draw your attention to the bottom one, which is institutional cash equity, which for most of the bank is a losing uh, making proposition. The average profitability is 2%, minus 2%, sorry. And a lot of the banks are losing money here. Yeah. Now they clearly see that as a, as a loss leader to be able to uh, play in prime services and equity derivatives. But how long will that be sustainable? That's the question. And finally, for IBD, just to highlight DCM quite profitable. MNN, ECM, a lot of questions. Banks are more spread. Some banks are losing money. Um, a few, uh, clearly a few also questions around banker coverage by sector, by country, uh, and so on. So just to conclude, as a summary, I think, from, from, from that session, key message is the industry is going through structural change. We see limited medium term growth. In addition, we think the next one or two years are likely to be very challenging. We discussed very weak land activity. There's going to be some further adjustment of front office headcount. Maybe pressure on the front office comp as well. And clearly a need to think about the non-front office activities where there are a lot of cost, middle back office. Investment banks, we think, will have two strategic options in front of them, either go for completeness or for high efficiency. And in order to get there, they will have to make decisions, very tough decisions, actually, uh, along these three dimensions of which region do they want to play in. Do they really want to be across all of us, at the same time, FICC, equities, IBD? And then more difficult, which product below do they want to, to compete in? So with this uh, thought in mind, I will ask my colleague Suprabha to come for her presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon. Stefan has just showed us how the financials of investment banks have changed significantly in the past few years, causing them to reassess the business models. Now, I'm going to be talking about how banks are reassessing their operating models in response to the structural shifts in the industry. Let me begin by explaining what we mean by a bank's business model and an operating model. The bank's business model is about what to sell, whom to sell, and which regions to serve. The bank's operating model is about execution. It is about people, processes and technology that are used to serve the business. In this session, I will be talking about can you hear me? Yeah. In this session, I will talk about how banks are transforming their operating models to address long-term profitability issues. So why do banks need to transform their operating model? We have seen that the profitability of investment banks is declining in the past few years, as Stefan showed in his earlier presentation. We believe that this is happening because of three structural changes in the industry. Number one, the impact of regulations. Number two, industry revenue is declining as such, as Stefan uh, showcased in the earlier presentation. Number three, technology is changing the face of the industry and reducing its pricing power. A couple of examples will make this clear. Because the regulations governing the OTC derivatives is changing, we are seeing that the FICC business, which has shrunk in the past two years, is expected to shrink further. In response, some large banks have started dismantling their commodity desks and commodity derivative desks. On the technology side, we see that automated platforms and electronic trading are actually lowering the transaction costs. But however, they are also significantly bringing down the differentiation levels that banks can display and also reducing pricing power. I'd like to point that banks have indeed done a number of restructuring initiatives in the past few years, including reducing headcount and also coming out of unviable businesses. However, the point to note here is the cost to income ratio continues to be very high in comparison with the pre-crisis period, which means banks got to do much more. Across all the banks that we work with, we're seeing two things happening. First, banks are drawing up plans to restructure their operations in front office, middle office, as well as back office functions. Secondly, we're seeing that banks are reassessing the deployment of people, processes, and technology in these functions. 
So now let us look at how banks are transforming their operating model. If you look at front office, the guiding factor here is differentiated service quality. Irrespective of whether a bank wants to be a full service bank or restrict its operation to niche uh, segments, we believe this will be a critical factor. We are seeing that banks are pursuing differentiation in areas such as research and data products, ease of execution of trade through electronic trades, as well as uh, in areas such as collateral management. For example, in collateral management, ba banks are trying to bring in new skills such as collateral calculation and management skills so that they can have a competitive edge. If you look at middle office, we see that cost optimization is the key driver. In the past few years, banks have made significant investments in risk management platforms and IT platforms. All of these have actually helped banks manage regulations. However, this has come at the cost of profitability. We believe it is time for banks to take a hard look at the high cost structure in the middle office area. In this context, we believe there's an opportunity for banks to come together to put together common industry assets which can handle activities that are duplicative in nature across the banks. A case in point here will be counterparty credit risk assessment reports, which is performed by all banks uh, for setting exposure limits. This is an activity that can be largely done out of a single platform and result in significant cost savings for the banks. While this concept is not yet a reality, we are in discussions with some of our clients that we work with to create common industry utility for production of counterparty credit risk assessment reports. Initial discussions show us that 80% of this can be done through a single production platform and 20% will have to remain in-house. And as I said earlier, this is a function that can drastically cut down costs in the middle office area. Moving on to look at back office. Back office has always been in the thick of action when it ca came to cost saving initiatives within banks. Today, the mandate for back office is very clear. Re-engineer processes in front office and middle office, uh, increase the level of automation and enhance specialization, and migrate these to back office. As banks are transforming their operating model, we are also seeing that banks are consolidating offshore vendors. The primary reason behind this is Banks need strategic partners to run transformational agenda. One of the key decisions in the changes discussed above will be, where will people be located? And in this context, offshoring becomes critical and will be, will be a key enabler for the transformation. With that background, let us look at what we believe is the next wave of offshoring. While offshoring will be a key enabler, it will be fundamentally different from the vanilla offshoring of the earlier period. Traditional offshoring has been a play, a play on the migration of people and processes from one location to offshore locations. Technology played a sig less significant role. In the new wave of offshoring, we believe leveraging technology and analytics will come in a big way. We see already banks stepping up the use of tools and analytics to standardize existing research tasks and enhance productivity. Another key development that we see here is that banks are now looking to offshoring functions that were traditionally not considered to be offshoreable. Some examples here will be building pricing models and index management services. Today, we see that there are banks in UK and Europe who are looking at setting up, uh, setting up teams in offshore locations to provide support for these. We are seeing that there are three new offshoring solutions that are emerging within banks. And we look at them in that order. Firstly, we're seeing that banks are setting up integrated teams across on-site, near-shore, and offshore to enhance front office specialization. Secondly, we're seeing that banks are setting up common unified teams in a single location, mostly offshore, to support multiple services, and we see this coming up more in the middle office area. Finally, banks are looking to solve their talent problems today by tapping into the global offshore talent pools. Again, I'll give a few examples to make this clear. Today, we are seeing large banks are streamlining their research desks with offshore teams independently handling coverage of low-volume stocks. <clears throat> 
large banks are also asking offshore providers to set up nearshore centers so that they can get high quality support for their on-site teams. Both of these are helping on-site teams spend quality time and more time in institutional client servicing. The second example that I would like to give relates to global offshore talent pool. Offshoring solutions are gaining a place in areas that are talent staffed such as CCAR work and quant work which require niche analytical capabilities. Here we are seeing that banks are using third party offshore solutions now, something which was inconceivable a few years ago. If this is the next wave of offshoring that we see, what is the overall potential for restructuring? Over the past 6 to 12 months, most large banks have embarked on a transformational agenda. We believe large banks will be the first movers here in terms of transforming their operating model. Several mid-sized banks are also looking at offshoring so that they can compete more effectively in the market. So how far can this go? Crystal believes that, the, but that by the time banks transform their operating model, offshoring headcount will move from current levels of 10 to 12 percent to go up to 25 to 30 percent of overall banks headcount. As you can see in the chart below, the offshoring levels will vary across functions. It can be in the range of 15 percent in sales and structuring and can go up to 80 percent in areas such as research. Many people ask us how we have arrived at these numbers. We have used one of the three approaches to derive these numbers. These are actual observed levels in certain clients or these are numbers that banks have actually committed as part of their transformation agenda in internal dashboards or we have, com we have compiled a detailed activity wise analysis that we've done across functions to look at offshore penetration levels. If you look at the methodology here, if you look at the chart here, it has both traditional offshoring levels as well as uh, new wave of offshoring. The top portion of the chart would appear that banks have found offshoring solutions across all the activities, as you can see that the blue tick marks here dominate. However, this was more in the traditional model of offshoring. The second chart that I'm showing here, it, which is the new wave of offshoring, our analysis identified many more activities within the functions that can be potentially offshore, and some banks have already started using it, as you can see. The number of reds that are given here show that there is still a fair way to go before realizing the full potential of offshoring in these activities. What you see is an overall summary and there's a detailed further breakdown in terms of activities that we performed and validated it with our clients. Finally, let us now look at a more detailed analysis on the COO and CFO functions uh, within the bank. The COO and the CFO office functions are in the forefront for new offshoring initiatives. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the COO and the CFO office function, as I said, are in the forefront of offshoring initiatives. Between the two offices, the underlying tasks and skills are very similar. Data analysis, data gathering, monitoring, review, etc. Integration of these two activities, therefore, can actually enhance productivity levels within the bank. The table that you see here shows the observed offshoring levels that we've seen across 12 banks that we work with. The minimum and the maximum here refers to the observed offshoring levels again across clients and the red dot that you see is the median. If we take one of the line items which is the CFO reference data, offshoring can help provide efficient and cost effective management of uh, data for, uh, which includes data on clients, contacts, as well as products. We believe swift offshoring is possible and the offshoring penetration levels can go up to 80 to 90 percent. In fact, we see that the majority of the people in these divisions are being transferred to offshore locations and technology is playing a huge role in the transformation here. At the other end of the spectrum, we have a line item like strategy and analytics where we believe data analysis can be offshore. However, the actual business review remains onshore. Here again, the offshoring levels will be in the range of 40 to 60 percent as you see. And we see global teams are being set up across onshore, nearshore as well as offshore locations.
With that, I would like to say that at Crystal, we believe that the investment banking industry has undergone some structural changes that are here to stay. Therefore, banks that are able to transform their operating model more radically and quickly are likely to come out ahead in the game. Thank you for your attention. I would now like to invite Serge De Costa, Head of Risk Analytics and Coalition, to make his presentation. Over to you, Serge. Thank you. We've, we've looked at the trends, the key trends within the industry. Then we've looked at how banks can adjust their um, operating model to match those um, trends. We're now going to have a look at the impact that the regulatory environment has on the return on equity that the bank generates. The way investment banks have been making strategic decisions has changed over the past two years. It used to be all about revenues, ranking. Now it's a lot more about return. And those returns currently are not very high, around 16% as reported. But after making a few adjustments um, to ensure like-for-like -like comparison, we reach something around 18%. Now, that return is much higher on the equity side, around 28%, than it is in fixed income around 14%, especially some businesses like rates and commodities are showing very low, um, very low return. Now what we're going to do in this presentation is we're going to try to understand the impact that capital is having on that return. We've looked at revenue and cost with um, Stefan's presentation. We're not going to focus on the capital component. Now the way the, way the capital is being calculated for the bank um, the regulatory capital is being calculated for the bank, is um, driven by two binding constraints. The first one is related with RWA. The capital is being calculated as a percentage of RWA. That's the first binding constraint. The second binding constraint is related with the exposure, the amount of exposure that the bank is taking, where the capital is being calculated there as a percentage of the exposure. Now, those two binding constraints provided by the regulation um, are likely to get tougher over the next few years. For example, on the RWA side, we will see that percentage increasing, the ca capital percentage increasing from 8% to 10.5% or more with the implementation of Basel III. The definition of the RWA will also likely be changed, for example, discussions around using the standard approach as a floor for the calculation. On the leverage side, which is a more recent um, constraint, it is likely that by 2019, 2018, 2019, the minimum capital requirement will be around 3% of the exposure. But in most countries, it's very likely to be much higher. And there again, the definition of the exposure is uncertain and could still make the overall constraint more difficult to comply with. As a result of those two, those two constraints, banks are very much focusing on two areas. The first one is understanding the RWA consumption and how it can be reduced. And secondly, is understanding the exposure consumption and how that can be reduced. So we're going to look at those two areas and what banks are or will be doing to address those. So first, let's look at the RWA consumption. So we have identified three key um, areas where banks are working on to reduce the amount of RWA that is being consumed, going from more tactical areas to more strategic ones. The first one is model improvement, such as getting regulatory approval or improving the quality of the data that goes into the models. The second one is related with reducing the amount of risk taking that the, the bank is, is doing or just increasing the amount, of, the amount of hedging, being either on the market risk side or for um, counterparty exposure. It's easy to say, but obviously there is a cost to those, um, those hedging activities, being either financial, the actual cost of hedging, or being related with any type of balance sheet consumption that those hedges could generate. <coughs> 
The third area is related with business mix optimization, understanding which area, which activities are consuming more or less RWA, and hence deciding which area, which business lines you want to extend, maintain, or reduce going forward. Now, for the next two pages, we're going to look at some example and more details around the model improvement and then the business mix optimization. First, model improvement. Model improvement is, is key for the, for the investment bank, is critical. And the reason is, is the following. So on, on this chart, we've looked at the difference in um, the, the variation in model RWA consumption across different banks. So for the same amount of risk, what we are saying here is that within IRC models across banks, we see variation going from one to six. And for IRC in particular, this is related with the fact that the, the regulation is not very clear on how the um, incremental risk charge has to be modeled. For VAR and stress VAR, the difference um, across banks is more one to five, around one to five. The difference there related with the amount of RWA coming from standard approach, um, as well as, for example, using different stress period for the stress VAR calculation. In CVA, the difference, one to three, mostly related with the fact that CVA is the latest addition within the regulatory environment, and hence banks are at a different stage in terms of implementing um, that particular model. We can also see that for credit risk, the difference between banks is much smaller. And that is very important here because the key message of, of this page is to say that for risk that are market risk or risk, risk calculation that are specific to the investment banks, models are much more important than it is for the overall group where obviously credit risk is a much more important component. The second area where we're going to um, dive into is looking at how banks are going about the business mix optimization. Now, we've here a, a diagram which illustrates how some, um, some banks are going, going about it and then a, 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 live, a live example. So first, look at your own return on equity. On the y-axis here, your own return on equity. On the x-axis, the industry's return on equity. We end up with four, four situations, four cases. The first one, top right corner, where you've got a great ROE in an industry which has a great ROE also. Fantastic. And um, you, you may want to focus on increasing penetration with client, gaining market share, and benefiting from economies of scales. The second case is where you've got great ROE in an industry which has poor ROE. In this case, you may want to consider leveraging your competitive advantage. What does that mean? It means you're in a unique position where you can afford to go and make sure you capture most profitable business, which at the point where other banks most likely are going to have to move away from that most profitable business. The third case is where you've got low ROE in an industry which has high ROE, in which point most likely you've got something to fix. <laughs> and um, the last case, which is the one we're going to look um, more into, is where you've got the low ROE in an industry which has low ROE. So we're now going to look at a live case um, of a bank which identified some of those and decided to exit those business lines and the impact that it had. So in this case, we're going to call this bank Bank A. Um, and Bank A had a return at the end of 2012 of around 10%. Bank A identified a number of business lines where it had low RE, in, and the industry also had low RE, and decided to exit those business lines, move the asset into legacy or the bad bank, um, and that had a positive impact on RE. First of all, a large reduction in capital requirement, which increased the RE by about 26%. Of course, exiting those business lines also reduced the operating profit, which reduced the ROE by 6%. By the end of 2013, the investment bank had moved from 10% ROE to 30% ROE. We've looked at what banks can do to reduce the amount of RWA consumption within the investment banks, the first binding constraint. Now we're going to be looking at the second binding constraint what banks can do to reduce the amount of exposure 
and get the leverage ratio under control. Now, before we do that, let's look at the current stage, um, the current state of the market. First of all, one thing to keep in mind is that the 3% that people hopefully are familiar with, the, the minimum ratio is at the group level. It doesn't apply for the investment bank alone. However, what we have done on this page is for the investment bank, we've looked at out of eight banks we have analyzed how many are actually meeting that 3% requirement. And the answer was that actually six of them out of eight are not meeting that requirement. So the question is, what is the action plan for those, for those banks? So we've identified, again, three, three areas where bank can, can work on. The first one, same as for RWA, is related with business mix optimization. Looking at where, which, which businesses are consuming a lot of exposure and um, hence deciding which business to expand or, or reduce. Now here we are in a very different situation than we are on the RWA side. On the RWA side, a lot of that has already happened. Banks have looked at it for many years and have already taken decision. In terms of the exposure, banks are only starting to look and understand what are the key drivers of the exposure in light of the new regulatory requirement. And we believe that the next stage is going to be to see some more strategic decision around, around business mix. The second thing that can be done is to optimize resource more effectively. Um, capital and balance sheet together as a tandem based on a comprehensive set of performance metrics, not only revenues but also return and making sure to meet all the regulatory requirements. And then the last one is looking for any um, improvement in the exposure calculation. Now the exposure calculation is a pretty standard calculation. Um, we believe there isn't a, a lot of optimization or, or improvement that can be done. However, there is always um, some, for example, banks could be looking at improving the amount of netting that happen um, by ensuring to have the right legal opinions for um, the, um, the, the, the requirement for the netting. So to summarize the, the key messages from, from this presentation, first, low ROE and toughening regulatory environment is going to create a need to look at two binding constraints. First one, RWA, the second one, the amount of exposure. For RWA, banks have already done a lot. They have, and, and they will continue to do. Improve the models, increase the hedging, and refine, tweak the business mix. For, on the exposure side, banks are currently assessing the impacts of the new requirement, and we're way less advanced. But banks are gonna be looking at any type of improvement they can do on the actual calculation of the exposure. And secondly, we'll also evaluate any change or tweak they can do to their business mix. Thank you, and I will ask, um, oh, sorry, I missed one point, <laughs> which is that um, over the next few years, we actually expect our REIT to increase slightly, as banks are gonna exit area where they're less profitable, which is gonna allow banks that are profitable to become more profitable in those areas, and hence we're gonna see ROE increasing, increasing slightly. Now I'm gonna ask Stamatula to come for the next presentation. Thank you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Serge has just shown you the wider variations in RWAs and therefore capital requirements across the industry. A significant reason for this variation is the use of different models across different banks. Therefore, I will be talking here today about the role and importance of modeling in efficient capital management. Here I should add that this is my first presentation ever without using equations, just trying to keep things simple. Now, never models have been more important than they are today. This is mainly 
because regulators have made Montreal central in determining the bank's capital requirements. Banks are also using model outputs in order to make strategic business decisions. Therefore, RWA models need to be very robust. It is therefore very important what modeling approaches one chooses to use. So concepts such as model theory, model data feeds, model assumptions, etc., can have a significant impact on capital requirement levels. While regulators have mandated the use of the models, banks' senior management is also using model outputs in order to make strategic business decisions. In one of our clients, we had to help them calculate RWAs at trade level. Even though those model outputs were primarily used for regulatory capital purposes, senior management could also see what rates were more profitable and what rates were less RWA intensive. Therefore, they could focus on particular trades and use these inputs for strategic business decisions. Bear the above in mind, a bank would need to dedicate a significant amount of resources in modeling and technology. Banks are also seeking external help from consulting and specialist firms, such as Crisil, in order to respond in a timely manner to regulatory and senior management requirements. Now, let us see what are exactly the main regulatory expectations and how banks are faring against those expectations. Based on my experience as a former regulator and on Crisil's experience of working with a number of different investment banks across different regulatory jurisdictions, this slide shows you some of the key aspects that regulators look. It also shows you what we observe as the current state of the industry in the modeling related activities. The first area to look at is sound model development. We have seen many instances of regulators checking to ensure that models are used for their intended purpose. In one instance, we saw that models which were originally meant to calculate regulatory capital, they were also leveraged for economic capital calculations. Clearly, that was something which caught the regulator's attention as regulatory capital models are supposed to be responsive to short-term effects, while on the other hand, economic capital calculations need to be much more stable. Another point which is quite important is that the underlying modeling theory is robust. For example, would you use a more sophisticated simulation model or would you use a simpler fallback model that represents the level of accuracy that you want. Moreover, use of relevant data is key. We have seen quite a few instances where models have been using inputs from the period 2009 or 2010 onwards. It will be very difficult to get such model past the regulator as the 2008 financial crisis has been missed out completely. 
Now, let us move to the model validation. Regarding model validation, regulators require model validation and model development functions to be completely independent. By now, most large investment banks have established independent model validation functions. However, other areas such as model benchmarking or model documentation require further improvements. It is very important that models get properly documented in order to meet the regulatory standards and in such way to be reconstructable by a third party. Model governance. When it comes to model governance, we have seen that banks have broadly put in place procedures and policies and now are making significant investments in model audit area. However, in our experience, the most neglected aspect has been getting business inputs into the models. Finally, it is important to ensure that those models are well integrated with the bank's systems and processes. In one bank, we saw that models were in place in order to compute risk. However, those models could run on a daily basis only 70% of the time due to limited computing capacity. So, overall, considerable progress has been made, but a few key areas remain of concern. For the remainder of the presentation, therefore, we will focus on the two most critical areas of concern, which are highlighted in red in the table, the first being linking macroeconomic variables with stress testing models, and the second, getting adequate input from business into the models. Now, let us turn our attention to the first issue I've just mentioned. One of the key challenges that we see banks have is to correlate models with macroeconomic variables. So how is this linkage established? To illustrate this, we have compared the traditional modeling approach to a more rigorous modeling approach, which is based on macroeconomic factors for brokerage fees. As you can see on the slide, while the traditional modeling approach relies on subjective factors and limited data, building a proper stress testing model involves significant use of data and establishing a statistical relationship with macroeconomic variables such as GDP growth, interest rates, etc. Since building proper stress testing models require substantial effort from the banks, the banks need to make significant investments in gathering data, modeling, model documentation, model validation. It is therefore important that banks link the amount of modeling effort to the materiality of the underlying drivers such as income and expense drivers. For example, in this chart, for a pure investment bank, such as Morgan Stanley, 90% of overall income is non-interest income, while for another bank, such as RBS, this amount is only 30%. So clearly, the focus of the modeling effort in both these banks will have to be very different. Now, overall, Chris's experience suggests 
that where banks have good cooperation amongst the different stakeholders, regulatory capital calculation frameworks tend to be better. Crisil also believes that in the case of stress testing, scenarios obtained from front office insights tend to be the most relevant. Similarly, for complex instruments like exotic derivatives, it is very important to tap into the knowledge of the traders. In the middle office, banks need to ensure better data availability and adequate technology investments. Finally, there has been often a misconception that the most complex models are the best ones. In Chris's view, this is not strictly true. Use of the most appropriate model rather than the most complex one is very important. Indeed, one of the key debates currently in the industry is whether internal models of banks have become overly complex and whether standardized models need to be more emphasized. That concludes my presentation.